Europol Operational Center and the creation of the European Cybercrime Center, the European Innovation Lab and the European Internal Internet Referral Unit within the European Counterterrorism Center. Uh, a quick word about the Cyber Peace Institute. Uh, through assistance, accountability and advancement, the Cyber Peace Institute enhances the stability of the cyberspace. They support vulnerable communities, analyze attacks collaboratively and advance responsible behavior. The Cyber Peace Institute decreases the harms of escalating cyber conflict to realize the promise of the digital era for people all over the world. And we have with us uh, Roman as well, Roman Adabchik. He's research coordinator at the EU Disinfo Lab. The EU Disinfo Lab is an independent non-profit organization focused on tackling sophisticated disinformation campaigns targeting the EU, its member states, core institutions, and core values. The webinar should last about uh, an hour and will be recorded. Uh, please feel free to write questions you would like to ask in the questions section of this webinar uh, and uh, the speakers will be responding to you right after their presentation. And I now give the floor to Stefan who will cover the topic of cyber threats. Thank you. Thank you for this introduction um, and uh, everyone welcome. Again, it's a pleasure. First, I want to thank uh, Gary for the, for the invitation. Pleasure to be with you and to share what we can share today in this very interesting um, topic. I like the fact that we are focusing on a community that sometimes is not the one that is making the, the news uh, when it comes to the wider um, scope of the uh, emergency providers. So very, very um, glad and pleased to, to be here with you. I will, um, what, how do you want to proceed, uh, Gary? Shall I uh, make a short intro in like seven minutes, something like this? Or do you want me to go through my whole presentation? How would you like to, uh, to prefer this? It's really, really as you wish, Stefan. You have a, about a half an hour slot. Okay. That you I'll can arrange. It, I'll so I'll just put back the screen to be shared. And we go for this. I don't know if anyone, everyone can see my screen. I'll try to go into presentation mode. Can you see my screen? Hello? Yes, Stefan. OK, great. <laughs> so thanks again. And I'll jump into the topics right away when it comes to uh, trying to, um, to frame the, the threat landscape uh, when it comes to uh, the infodemic and how the infodemic is accelerating uh, cyber attacks. First, a bit of definition. So to be clear what we are talking about, the um, what do we mean by infodemics? Not so much what we mean by infodemic. It's a word that has been put forward by the World Health Organization. So it, uh, it revolves around the abundance of, uh, even overabundance of information being accurate or not accurate, it's, it's about a swan of information that it makes hard for people to find uh, trustworthy sources and reliable guidance when they need it. So why the Cyberbase Institute is looking into this phenomenon? Because we saw in the past already that such um, overdrive of information is a vector that is used uh, historically by uh, cyber attackers uh, when they want to uh, target uh, vulnerable populations. So, as you can see in the slide, is that uh, we see the infodemic from the point of view of being an accelerator of cyber attacks. Um, that is not a new phenomenon, I will come back to that. Um, that uh, in the context of the COVID-19 crisis, uh, it's used, um, sadly enough, using well-known uh, modus operandi to uh, demand ransom or steal personal information or to disrupt essential services. And interestingly, we'll focus also in uh, how this is uh, today impacting the, uh, the healthcare sector and the wider healthcare supply chain. So the, um, the infodemic is not new, as I was mentioning. And uh, just on the slide, you can see a short uh, um, history, let's say, on how it happened, uh, for example, uh, at the moment of the Ebola outbreak. And what is interesting is to see that the modus operandi did not change so much, which is quite concerning in the sense that what did we learn from this uh, attack linked to an uh, existing outbreak like Ebola? And what did we not learn 
showing the fact that we are still vulnerable to this kind of modus operandi today. So at the time, there was uh, quickly, at the moment of the outbreak, um, spreading of scams via email and phishing campaign that was just uh, using the uh, Ebola as a brand, let's say, in order to impersonate the health sector or emergency services. Um, and with the, with the very um, known um, approach as uh, fake attachments, so weaponized attachments in emails in order to drop malware, and you have some examples on the screen. Um, other parts that were having a direct impact on the victim because it was um, it was accelerating an attack, so like a phishing campaign uh, or malware distribution. But at the same time, as this attack were done by impersonating telecoms, media outlet, or international organization, it had the side effect to undermine the trust in these organizations. So when they were really trying to outreach to the population, it was more complicated for them to have the message going through because they were part also uh, of a wider infodemic where uh, a slice of information was generated and used and put forward by um, malicious actors. Um, this is not linked only to outbreaks, so I took Ebola as an example. It's linked to anything that is global and that is triggering emotions and uh, hunger for information. So as, as a large part of the public is uh, into uh, itself a crisis or interested into an ongoing crisis, uh, criminals for years always leverage this uh, information to uh, build wide attacks. Uh, you had them in, in the context of the Charlie Hebdo attack or in the context of uh, other pandemics. Um, let's focus a bit on what is happening now in the, in the context of COVID-19. So just give me a second, I lost my screen. Yeah. So um, what are the, 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 the markers, the, uh, the, 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 the hints, the indicators uh, showing that we are in a similar activity, but at a very different scale? And I will come back to the why we have a different scale. Um, you will see this uh, online on several um, sources that are documented the new domain name that has been purchased since the beginning of the outbreak. And this is a well-known modus operandi for cyber criminals, cyber attackers, is that uh, if you buy a domain name that is close to COVID-19 or coronavirus, then you're going to pretend to be, um, to be a legitimate entity when you're going to start your, your attack or to spread your to spread your, your disinformation as a vector of attack so as you can see uh, a lot of uh, registration and this is just on the rise and there was for example a, 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 a spike when the term covid19 was uh, announced by the body ratio then suddenly criminals right away went to buy domains in order to craft their infrastructure uh, to be in capacity to attack in the future um, on markets, uh, specifically in the dark web, where the cyber crime or the cyber attack as a service is um, is, is happening as a daily uh, daily commodity. So, what is it for 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 the ones that are not into the topic? Is the fact that an attack, a cyber attack, you can slice it with different uh, steps and different expertise. So instead of having one person doing everything from the coding of the malware to the uh, managing of the uh, of the package of infection to the whole social engineering in order to uh, better target the uh, the victim you can slice it in sub services and you can subcontract and basically in these markets you can buy part of the subcontracting in order to have your overall attack so you could see this uh, last week's um, a discount on the dark web with the coronavirus specials where you could buy this uh, uh, sub process for your attack at a cheaper price so this shows that there's an appetite for um, for uh, malicious actors to increase their capacity and to um, and, and and to scale up the uh, the attack vectors um other example on the slide in terms of of, of increase uh, i will focus on the last two points so first is that the attacks as it was in the past, are still impacting and targeting the health sector. So the health sector historically is a sector that is very um, um, interesting and attractive for uh, for actors for cyber operations because it's uh, it's a sector that uh, is very close to uh, critical services. Meaning, if you attack the sector, you have, a, for example, with a ransomware, 
you have a high chance to get uh, the ransom paid because you are crippling something that is of a vital need for, uh, for the population. Um, this is not new. This is not something that is related to the crisis of COVID-19, but what is new is, uh, as everyone knows, is how we rely today on a formant, efficient, and healthy, I would say, health sector. And any operation that is targeting the health sector now is having an impact that is way uh, greater than it could have uh, had uh, only one year ago. So that's that's one angle. Second angle is um, looking into some specific modus operandi and uh, specific targets. Uh, there would be also the need now to gather more information in terms of who is uh, behind uh, the uh, the attack, um, because when it comes to cyber operations, you could see like two big groups of uh, of attackers, uh, criminal groups that are motivated mostly by. Uh, by making a profit, generating profit for themselves. And the other one would be more politically driven groups, could be state actors or non-state actors, but they are following a politically dry, uh, driven um, agenda. And when you see uh, some instances of attacks for the past weeks, um, it's, it goes way beyond what uh, criminal groups are uh, historically doing. So interesting also to focus that today, the infodemic, this overdrive of information, is giving an environment that is fertile enough for various types of attackers to move their to move their malicious agenda. Um, putting the conversation in the context of um, emergency service uh, sector um, and the type of uh, vulnerabilities that could be uh, that could be found. So um, again, nothing new. It's uh, vulnerabilities that uh, I'm pretty sure the audience knows very very well. But in the context of today, uh, the fact that there's an increase in the uh, appetite of attacking by the malicious actors, and at the same time, there's an increase on the pressure on the emergency service sector not to be in capacity to respond to the public need, and this convergence is creating a new, uh, is, is increasing the, um, the, 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 the threat, uh, the, the, the threat image. Um, some example. Um, we saw in the past some, um, okay, I'll go back to ransomware because it's it's mainstream, it's known, and it's still the majority of the type of attack that could happen. So we saw that uh, in the past campaign of ransomware against the, the network of a city uh, would impact uh, or the chance to impact the, the network of computer aid uh, dispatch. So that would be very complicated for now for uh, emergency uh, service sector to respond at scale if a uh, attack like ransomware would impact this um, computer aided uh, system. Uh, we saw what happened, for example, in Baltimore in 2018 when uh, there was a uh, the effect of a ransomware that was impacting this uh, very critical cap capacity. Um, only in 2018, again, to look into this year, there were uh, in the US uh, at least uh, 40 uh, documented uh, ransomware campaign against uh, 911 uh, call centers. So sadly enough, it's not new. It's just increasing in scale because of the environment that is increasing the scale of the attacks. Um, another type of risk would be um, the, the risk profile of the next generation of the 911 capabilities that are going to allow for and are already allowing for um, more uh, type of input of information for the public to interact with the emergency service sector. Um, this also uh, drive new possibility for the public, but also change the threat uh, landscape. And as on the other end, attackers are getting more and more um, sophisticated. Uh, there's a need now to be sure that this sophistication is matched with the uh, cyber resilience of this uh, next gener generation 911 services. Um, other type of threats that is again building from a very well known um, malicious modus operandi online, which is the distributed denial of services or so DDoS attack. Um, that is also happening sometimes via telephonic network only, so it's more DDoS than a DDoS. But for DDoS, we saw that in the past uh, as uh, overflowing the network in order to cripple the capacity um, of the emergency uh, service sector 
to uh, have system that stays uh, afloat. So for the for the one that uh, that are following this uh, webinar and are uh, acute to the um, to the question, nothing new when it comes to threats and um, I mean from the technical side of the threat, um, it's just that the risk is increased because of what is happening now in terms of environment, because of this pressure on the one that are um, operating the network, the increase in offer when it comes to cyber cyber attacks, and the very high impact of any disruption in these services today. So the environment is uh, really driving now the increase of the threat, uh, the threat landscape, uh, the increase of the level of the threat, land, the threat landscape, sorry. Um, so looking uh, looking ahead um, and recognizing that uh, it's sadly a reflex to think about what to do at crisis time uh, and that maybe as a community we don't use enough time in between crises to think about how to be better equipped, better prepared because this costs resources, this costs time and you have the emergency in this context line to, to run. So um, the normal best practices applies. So to be sure that if you are running uh, or you are interfacing, um, for example, in the wider supply chain with an emergency service sector, cybersecurity policies are in place. Cybersecurity strategy is very clear. Um, we will, I mean, you can find a lot of these uh, best practices uh, on very trusted resources. I will, for example, just top of my head, recommend the one from the Global Cyber Alliance uh, when it comes to uh, securing system and providing very good practices and, 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 and pragmatic solution in order to help uh, securing and increasing your systems. So it's about patching, it's about making sure that um, you have the right uh, cyber hygiene, uh, technically, but also from the, the, the staff, the staff point of view, that uh, people are trained, they, are, uh, they know what is uh, what are the risks, and they know what to do and what not to do. Um, a bit of what we have today in terms of um, recommendation to uh, stay home, stay safe, stay home, you're going to protect the others, is the same in the cyberspace, is that if you, um, are focusing on basic cyber hygiene um, yeah, habits, then you're going not only to protect yourself, but you're going to protect uh, others. And um, this can be something that would be the first, uh, the first step to outreach to uh, um, the wider ecosystem that is now revolving around the uh, emergency service sector. Because what do we see now is industries that were specialized into these services that are scaling up capacity very fast. When you scale up very fast, it means in terms of uh, staff induction or in terms of procurement, you're taking risk and cyber risk are part of it. Or you see industries that are not used to this, um, to this environment that are redirecting the capacity to provide uh, infrastructure tools uh, for the one in need. The same, what is their level of readiness when it comes to cyber in this new context? And uh, you have everything that you see happening now, and it's very uh, to be uh, to, to be welcome. Uh, this crowdsourcing of collective intelligence with volunteers, people that are gathering in hackathons in order to provide services uh, for free for um, for the community. Uh, again, cybersecurity by design is important. So, and it boils down to really um, to to really solid and known principles that are there in the community for, for long. Um, when you want to uh, face uh, staff, uh, because it, it always starts with, with this, so staff and to increase the, um, the awareness, simple messages that we would, uh, we would advocate uh, around the idea that if you protect yourself, you're protecting the others. So, and to say that everyone at the end of the day has the skills, the basic skills, to be a cyber watchdog, analyst, uh, citizen to help the community. So it's about stopping. So when something is a um, an activity that you think is problematic or to be to be looked into, is just stop and think before doing anything. Don't click. Investigate. If um, something comes in as a data flow or new information, strange email. Make sure that you always double check the source. From an external, um, an external capacity, an external source, uh, an external source, 
and uh, by doing this contain so it stays with you so you don't spread it around so a bit of what we are asked to be doing in the in the real world today uh, to have exactly the same logic and mindset in the cyberspace and then to report is very important specifically uh, for the, the people working in emergency uh, service sector very close to our critical uh, services it's important to report so that uh, attackers and i was mentioning type of attackers before uh, would at some point face consequences because it's the the, the, the reporting is, is is critical to it so i hope that with this uh, outline i try to stay uh, below half an hour it's uh, opening the floor for for question and um, thank you for your attention Excellent. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Stefan. Super interesting. Um, there is a question uh, by Laure on the questions uh, section, which is, hi, how can you, we, estimate the number of phishing attacks and its increase? How can data be collected? Yeah, it's a very good question. Thank you for this one. And it opens a, uh, a challenge, an ongoing challenge, specifically in the cyber, in the cyber sphere is uh, how, to, um, how to have enough indicators that you can trust, where you can collect the same type of data in the same, same type of um, methodology in order to really trust the figures that you can see. So what I, what I looked into when building this, uh, this short presentation is uh, trends that I could uh, identify in between what is just, you know, uh, Actually reported by um, uh, mainstream and trusted media. Also looking into the field of experts that are also looking at this uh, in the wider context of attacks, and it has to be taken like this in terms of of, of trends. Uh, today, having a global overview of the number of phishing attacks, the type of phishing attacks, uh, and more importantly, the type of victims. Because sometimes when you have a very good view on the type of victims and you, have, and you look into victimology, why is someone wanted to attack that person? Then it gives you a lot of ideas about intent. So who can be the attacker and what has the attacker in mind? What, what is it? What, what is the added value? What is the, 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 the incentive for the attacker? And it's very difficult today to gather this data. So that's one of the mission of the Cyber Peace Institute uh, is to close this accountability gap and is to find the uh, right partnership, to find the right data, you know, to make sure that this is uh, not only available to the public, as this is what is happening today in COVID-19 attack, but also that with this data, we can go to analysis, look into the modus operandi, the type of infrastructure, and to enforce accountability. Otherwise, you just, you just rely on uh, Report one, then report two, then report three, and but what what to make out of it? Stefan, this is a very important what you're saying. Um, I'm, at Ina, we've been doing some work, and so my colleague Christina is on the line as well, and uh, some work on cybersecurity. And it's true that one of the culture of emergency services is rather to not speak too loud about cyber attacks and to rather hide them as much as possible, maybe hoping that it would disappear. And here you're pledging for the contrary, for the attackers to be sanctioned and for the attackers to be sanctioned, something needs to be done. Yes, it's about increasing the cost of an attack is that uh, as long as it's very uh, cost, not cost free, I would, uh, it's too much to say this, but uh, you, you, you see what I mean. The, the, the price is still quite low for an attacker when it comes to spreading a lot of attacks and what is really going to happen. So to, to change this, um, this mechanic. Absolutely. Excellent, Stefan. Uh, I'm sure, um, by the way, after this uh, webinar, we will be very much in touch and with the next steps for, for Rina. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. Uh, talking about increasing the cost of uh, cyber attacks, I could re easily make a parallel to trying to increase the cost of disinformation. And I think that's a good intro to give the floor to, uh, to Roman, who will speak about disinformation. Uh, Roman, you're still on mute for now, <laughs> but I guess something will happen that you can unmute yourself, or my colleague Bea will unmute ah, you. <laughs> yes. Here you are. Excellent. Now I, you're supposed to me. Yeah, I was saying that uh, it's uh, 
it's part of my uh, presentation also to talk about this. The cost of disinformation is something getting more important uh, for, for emergency services, hospital, and all this type of actors. So, start. can you my screen? Just can you confirm me that uh, you can my screen? For now, I can't see your screen, Roman. Yes, perfect. Uh, so uh, wait. I, now it's coming, apparently. Uh, yeah, so I need to hide this. Uh, okay, here we go. Ah, uh, sorry. I just need to find way to hide thing and we are going to be good. I think Roman, I would advise that you, you stop sharing your webcam if you can, because the data connection seems to be not so good. So maybe um, to release okay. a bit of the network. I will. Okay. Excellent. Is it better now? You can yeah. hear me and yeah. see my screen. Okay. So, so let's go. So, hello everyone, Roman Adamzid from the EU Info Lab. So, to give you just a small and quick background on, on what we are doing in terms of disinformation, we are monitoring all the fact check disinformation uh, items spread in France, Italy, and Spain. So, it's all the disinformation which was identified by uh, well known fact checkers. Uh, most of them are, even, are organized by the international uh, fat checking networks. And then, uh, based on this, we are trying to analyze the big trends of uh, disinformation and uh, to compare it to, to what is happening in uh, other countries, uh, mainly in uh, Western Europe. So, so during uh, this this uh, COVID-19 crisis, as you can uh, imagine, it has been a really, really busy time for us. So what is interesting is that we have seen an evolution of the disinformation. First, the disinformation started to focus on the crisis in China. Uh, so, so it was all about what was happening in uh, in China and trying to increase the fear about what is happening with both disinformation playing purely on health fear and some disinformation uh, more more based on uh, international uh, conspiracy theories where where did uh, this virus come from this kind of questions then we we saw a very specific period when the when the threat uh, got closer to Europe. It's the period of uncertainty, so it was a really 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 busy period in terms of uh, of disinformation and uh, with people trying to play on uh, all sorts of uh, of things to increase again fears. To try to play on, uh, to play on, uh, try, they announced, for example, a lot of fake measures uh, like linked to a future lockdown. We saw also here the, dev the start of a really an increasing of the number of disinformation uh, linked to uh, to false cures. And so, and so, yes, this. Uh, this uh, this period was really all about uncertainty and using this to spread disinformation. And then uh, finally, we had what we what we called the the local disinformation storm. It's really when the the star the crisis started to to really worsen in Europe. And so at this point, we saw we uh, we have started to to see in every country really a shift of the disinformation environment, with all the actors that we usually see spreading disinformation in the country 
uh, we are monitoring. They adapted all their, this information and all their messages to the local uh, to the local context. With uh, again still the same uh, question of the cures, health fears, uh, really, uh, and we also play on all the existing division in European society. So, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, narratives, oops, sorry, let's go back. Uh, like I, like I told you, uh, one important thing here is uh, is the question of health fears. So the use of decontextualized images and videos to, to try to increase uh, to increase the uh, the fear of the virus and this perception. For example, in the middle here, uh, it was a uh, it was a uh, an artistic, uh, an artistic, uh, how to say that in English, an artistic uh, event in Germany in 2014, and people use these pictures from 2014 to pretend it was uh, the situation currently in China with uh, people dying in the street. One thing really important, especially for, for emergency services, is the impersonation of media authorities or emergency services to increase uh, these fears. So, for example, one, one thing we have seen a lot, it's messages spread on WhatsApp with people uh, pretending to be doctors, uh, to uh, to represent some emergency services and uh, exaggerating the, the the importances of the crisis. Why is it interesting? If we are if we are going into a context of uh, of emergency services, it's interesting because um, as you as you can imagine, a lot of health fears is going to to lead to a lot of panic, and panic can make the life of emergency services even more complicated. For example, in Czech Republic, we have seen some disinformation saying that uh, uh, in the for the for the 112 uh, phone numbers in the Czech Republic, it's not firefighters who are, who are answering, but epidemiologists. So at one point, uh, the Czech emergency services really saw uh, really a skyrocketing of the calls. So for non uh, for for non uh, urgent questions. So it can be complicated uh, for them. Uh, then we have seen another example in uh, in Belgium with uh, fake uh, a fake message which was spread by uh, someone pretending to be a nurse from a big hospital in Brussels, and it led to panic to supermarkets. And uh, and here the last point which is also important. It's these people impersonating uh, emergency services, hospital and things like that. It's really cheap to do that. So in several countries, we have seen uh, an increase of, uh, of uh, hospital filing complaints, uh, so uh, judicia ju in uh, justice, against pe people uh, spreading this information so we need to have uh, to have uh, measures to uh, to increase the cost of this information okay here uh, i'm pretty sure you have heard also about it it's a lot of uh, messages announcing false cures vaccine often uh, using the same techniques like pretending to be doctors health authorities 
Uh, and what is interesting that uh, we have seen this everywhere with often messages being translated uh, from, a, from a language to another and spreading rapidly on uh, private messengers. And from uh, emergency services, a medical perspective, of course, there is the problem of uh, people using false cures against the virus. It can lead to an increase of uh, the people uh, coming, arriving to hospital or, or, or uh, of people need, who are going to need emergency services because then they got poisoned by uh, bad cures. Uh, there is also uh, a problem of, uh, of shortage with this kind of disinformation. Uh, in terms of medicines or equipment, if you have some disinformation with people claiming uh, if you want to, to be protected for, from the, from the COVID-19, you need this, this and this. And, the, and when it's something that emergency services are, are going to need, you need to be prepared for that. Then we have seen a lot of uh, conspiracy theories, uh, like pretending that the COVID-19 is a, is a bio weapon, uh, trying to pretend that some big labs uh, created, uh, created them and created the virus to, de to then uh, sell more vaccines, uh, often using, like for example, uh, documents, patents, uh, linked to research on virus. But we, uh, but people are going to twist this, like, like using this patent to say that people were already uh, working to create this new virus. And uh, also uh, this, with, uh, with this conspiracy theories, there is really also an, in, an intent to uh, decredibilize the, the, to decredibilize the, the words of, uh, of uh, authorities, of emergency services, like the, like our uh, scientists with people, for example, uh, pretending that uh, some doctors are linked to pharmaceutical uh, companies. And this can lead uh, to, concrete, uh, to concrete consequences. We have seen, for example, uh, this is not fully linked to emergency services, but some people burnt uh, last week in the UK 5G towers. And we have seen also a lot of pressures on, uh, sometimes uh, not a lot, but pressures on uh, health workers. For example, around the chlor chloroquine, uh, hydroxychloroquine, because uh, maybe you have heard, for example, Donald Trump promoted it uh, without, for now, we don't have a lot of certainty that it's uh, effic efficient against the coronavirus. And then this led to big conspiracy theories with uh, people, for example, accusing some specific hospital or some specific doctors to not uh, to work with the, the big pharmaceutical labs to not give these uh, new medicines. And, uh, and for example, uh, lately, lately uh, we have seen in France list of uh, hospitals uh, flagged by uh, people believing in conspiracy theories as, as the hospital uh, where people shouldn't go because they are not going to give the good medicines. So this can lead, for now I hope not, for now I don't think it's going to lead to really big, big complication, but it can, and you can have some people put it, like I said, putting pressure on health workers, on emergency services, for example, to say, I don't want to go to one uh, specific hospital or things like that. Then uh, what I call the fears linked to, to lockdown, 
it's like uh, it's really this is really specific to the to the second phase of the disinformation uh, we saw and uh, of the infodemic uh, it's really when people are, are getting scared about what is happening next uh, we have seen a lot of people spreading uh, disinformation like pretending that the government is going is going to close uh, supermarkets pretending that then the military are going to take over for example uh, on the here on this slide on the on the on the right you have a picture of military vehicles and this is something which was really spread in France with people pretending that the army was about to to take over to take over we have seen also uh, false information about supermarkets uh, uh, which were supposed to be closed in Italy and Spain uh, with people rushing because they were rushing to to make groceries because they were afraid of uh, what could uh, happen next and uh, it can lead to can lead to some consequences for emergency services. One big consequence we have seen uh, in uh, in France, but also uh, also in uh, in Italy, it's like rumors were were saying that uh, a lockdown was about to be applied only on Paris. And the consequences of, of this kind of rumors led to a lot of uh, Parisian people to leave the French capital. So, so uh, I'm not a specialist of emergency services, but for sure, when you have uh, thousands of people going out of uh, from Paris to other regions, it can lead to the need to adapt your 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 measures to fight uh, to fight uh, to fight for example uh, the covid-19 because um, because now some uh, region which were not that affected by the covid-19 are going to see more parisian people potentially sick they uh, coming there and risking to infect other people and with less capacity in terms of uh, of uh, beds uh, in hospital, for, in hospitals, for example, and then uh, narratives, uh, like I told you, in the last phase, it was really uh, we we have seen all the disinformation ecosystem uh, uh, sw switching to the COVID-19. So every topics linked to the divisions in uh, European society around identity, around economy, around politics. Uh, we are now seeing this linked to the COVID-19 with people, for example, here we have, here on the left, we have a message of someone pretending that church uh, churches are are now closed in France because of the lockdown, which is true, but pretending also that mosques are, are still open. So you see what, uh, which is false. So you see where is the, what is the purpose of the disinformation here is to play on a division in the society. Uh, here, for example, uh, you have, uh, you have uh, accusations of, uh, against one of the daughters who, who are the who is the who is the lead who, who is leading the response in France against the coronavirus, pretending that she got um, some money uh, from uh, lobbies. So that is why uh, the French government don't want doesn't want to to use the chloroquine. So you see, there is a all the all the disinformation is ecosystem now is is adapting uh, adapts uh, the messages 
to the to the COVID nineteen uh, situations. And so to finish uh, and to try to sum up about the main tactics uh, we have seen linked to the to the COVID nineteen and disinformation and what emergency services uh, could do. First, first, uh, what uh, what uh, what we have seen it's really an increase of the disinformation spread on private messaging apps, and here. Uh, here, for example, there, there is uh, an interesting uh, initiative from the from the WHO, so the World Health Organization. Uh, they created a boat on uh, on WhatsApp, where people uh, can connect to this boat, so to, can connect to this boat, and then the boat every day is going to send specific uh, updates about the situation, uh, about the health situation in uh, specific countries. So it's a new way to uh, to communicate for here, not fully emergency services, but an organization uh, which is work, which works on health issues to give updates. Uh, what we have seen also, like I told you, it's uh, adapted uh, it's a spreading uh, of the disinformation uh, at a global scale. So with disinformation, some disinformation adapted from one country to another, but following the same patterns. What we we have uh, one important tra trend is impersonation of authorit authoritative sources. Then uh, what this means for at least from my point of view, and I'm not an emergency specialist, emergency services specialist, that uh, emergency services need to have a clear, identifiable and verified presence online, for example, which means having uh, at least one Twitter account, which is uh, certified and authenticated by Twitter, so you are the source of uh, you are the source of the, of the information, and people can see that if someone is pretending to be you, he is not verified. So he's not. Um, so so you are the you are supposed to be the trusted sources, and like I like I said also, you know, for me emergency services now need to have a good presence uh, online to see what is happening and maybe to counter also this information first by spreading the right messages but also like I said make the cost of this information higher like some uh, organizations are doing now by uh, filing uh, complaints or uh, injustice. Like I said also uncertainty is used to spread this information. So communication has to be clear and proactive to explain what is happening, what is going to happen uh, to, to prevent the spread of this information. Uh, Decontextualized picture and videos, also this is an important trend. And uh, one point I didn't uh, mention uh, uh, previously, it's uh, also a lot of people try to to uh, uh, enter scientific deba debates, so trying to spread disinformation, conspiracy theory without having any scientific knowledge. So it's important to always have this communication from trusted sources which are capable of explaining every topic. So I still have five minutes, so it's good. So it, it leaves a bit of space for questions. All right, uh, Gary here. Thank you very much, Roman. Excellent presentation. Um, there was no question on the chat or in the question section that I could see. There was a contribution uh, from someone, but um, 
Uh, is there anyone who would like to ask a question and please raise your hand or write in the chat as you want and to raise your hand you can of course use the tool you have a little hand on which you can click on i don't think there are much questions or anything that i could see in the in the chat I can't see any questions so far. So, um, Roman, on my side, I have uh, no questions to ask, and I don't see anyone from the audience. Um, just uh, maybe a recap of both your presentation. There was something very strong in what you both said. It is that the attackers slash the people who spread massive disinformation should not uh, be left uh, unsanctioned. Uh, and I mean here the consequences are pretty huge as we all know and it's uh, very important that uh, you go uh, we work towards uh, not let, le letting it uh, unsanctioned so that you, we all work and I'm including you of course in this call attending this webinar we all work towards that uh, Roman and Stefan gave many practical examples of what we can do uh, towards that also in terms of how uh, we uh, public safety people communicate to put back expertise in the center of our communication to make sure we use we are present we occupy social media with certified accounts and that we communicate uh, clearly and on a regular basis with the relevant information uh, INA is, by the way, working on this topic and trying to compile how communication, crisis communication is being organized in many countries. Uh, since I live in Belgium, I'll, I'll give a, a quick round of applause to our Belgian uh, crisis center, which has been doing a tremendous work uh, with very regular expert communication every day, each morning, uh, kept uh, apolitical, uh, so non-political, uh, expert-based, uh, tackling this information each day, providing uh, uh, what I believe is very clear information to the Belgian population and the non-Belgian population living in Belgium. It has been uh, very useful. Uh, and I mean, this is very related to uh, disinformation in particular. Uh, that's actually how I came to work also with Roman on the disinformation sector is because I really believe that for public safety, we need to tackle, of course, both cyber threats, but also very much disinformation, which is affecting very clearly uh, the work of emergency services, not only during this pandemic, but it was also affecting uh, emergency services uh, hugely during the previous terrorist attacks that we had to go through in Europe. So um, I'd like to uh, really maybe take the opportunity to thank our excellent two speakers uh, for their time. We will be in touch with, bo with, with both of you. Uh, also, thank you to everyone who attended this, uh, this webinar. You were many, uh, numerous, almost 50 today. Um, please note uh, that um, the, the webinar that was scheduled on Friday with the platforms is postponed to another date, but we are working on a series of other hopefully very exciting webinars to come. Uh, more information on that later this week. Uh, and uh, after that, stay safe uh, and uh, take care. And we will speak uh, to with all of you very soon. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Gary. And everyone stay safe. Thanks again for your time. Thank you. Same here. Thank you very much for having us. and. Uh... Uh, stay safe and we all hope that the situation will get better soon. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.